Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. During the late winter months and on into spring, lice can be a pretty big problem for livestock, especially for beef cattle. Turns out now is the time for producers to take steps to address the problem. To learn more, here's SUNUP's Curtis Hare and our Extension Livestock Entomologist, Dr. Justin Talley. Well, a few weeks ago, we had our Extension Livestock Entomologist, Justin Talley, on talking about some insects that are impacting cattle. But uh, Justin, you know, this is about the time of year where producers need to start thinking about another insect that's impacting cattle, lice. Yeah, definitely so. When we think about the fall time period, sometimes you don't see the impacts of lice on cattle until later on in the winter and early spring. But this is actually the time when you really need to think about treating your cattle, especially if you have those that are always chronically infested with lice. So like, let's just dive into it. Uh, treatment, what, what can producers do? Yeah, there's several treatments, but most of them are pour-on type treatments. Uh, there's several out there that have dual action products or do what we call dual action active ingredients. Uh, those work really well because you usually don't have to apply those more than once. Uh, so it's usually a permethrin, diflobenzeron, which impacts the eggs. And so what's important about any kind of control product is that if you either spray your animals or use a pour-on, uh, because of the lice life cycle, most of those initial treatments will control the infestation, like what we call the adults and nymphs on the animals, but it does nothing for the egg stage, whereas these dual action products will control both the egg stage and the adults. Um, and it's not to say one is better than the other, it's just about how you work your animals. If you have no problem bringing your animals up and treating them uh, twice, that's the best route because we can look at those animals and know that the initial treatment knocks off that initial population, but then that second treatment takes care of that any st uh, uh, lice emerging from the eggs. It, you know, like, you know, shifting outside of cattle, do they also, is this something that producers need to think about, like sheep sheep and goat producers as well, just it really livestock in general in Oklahoma? Yeah, so when we think about livestock in general, uh, lice are very species specific. So the lice that get on cattle are only on cattle. The, uh, the lice that get on horses are usually only on horses. Now, sheep and goats overlap because we see a lot of overlap with those two species, but uh, if, uh, if you want to think about this, lice are very important in how they impact goat production. Uh, most of the lice that can get on goats can infest the goats in different ways. Uh, and likewise, on, on cattle, we have a kind of a multi, multiple species that can get on uh, different livestock. Uh, and then some of those species are what we call sucking lice and others are chewing louse. Most of the problems we see in cattle here in Oklahoma are chewing louse uh, and they can impact the cattle somewhat differently than sucking lice. Well, you know, you mentioned impacts. So what are some of the, what are the impacts that both of those types of lice can have on our livestock? Yeah, so when you think about livestock, if you think about uh, beef in particular, the, the biggest impact is just the, uh, amount of energy they have to de expend dealing with that stress stress and so when you think about the stress to the animals but there's also what we call those hidden costs if you've ever driven down a fence line in uh, anywhere from December through March and you see these balls of hair on the fence that's those are animals rubbing from lice and so some of the hidden costs of how the fence repairs you have to do because of the, of the animals rubbing there's also some things that uh, on the equine side, they can cause uh, what we call dermatitis. And so in, in certain equine species or breeds uh, can be more susceptible to lice infestation than others. And then goats and in particular sheep, there can, the, depending on the species, it can severely impact them, cause lesions, cause secondary infections. But uh, overall, when we think about uh, lice, and then li of course lice can get into poultry as well. So we're, we're, it's kind of all encompassing, but they impact all of our livestock species. Alrighty, thanks Justin. Dr. Justin Talley, livestock entomologist here at Oklahoma State University. Welcome to this week's edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. I'm Wes Lee. Several crops grown in Oklahoma tend to rely on cold weather to help with harvesting. This would include things like cotton and pecans, among others. This year, freezing weather has not been widespread in Oklahoma, at least through November 9th. 
This map shows most of the state has yet to reach the freezing mark. There have been multiple days in the Panhandle and a few days scattered in the west, northeast, and surprisingly in the far southwest. Based upon the last 30 years, the median freeze date for our mesonet sites is between late October in the north and early November in the south. The latest median freeze date is Hugo in Choctaw County. If we look at the latest dates of the first fall freeze, we see that 90% of the time it freezes by about the third week of November. There are a couple of outliers, again mainly in Choctaw and surrounding counties. By this weekend, we will likely add many first fall freezes to the map. This is the forecasted lows for Saturday morning, showing many locations below the freezing mark. This should have leaves falling off the cotton and husk opening on the pecan trees to help with harvesting very soon. Now here's Gary with some additional cold weather information. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well this is one of the first weeks where we didn't add too much color to that drought monitor map. We actually took a lot of color off. Let's get straight to that map and see what we have. Well now on the broad picture we still have quite a bit of that abnormally dry uh, condition uh, labeled on the map. That's the yellow. And we have uh, still some of that moderate to severe drought. A little tiny bit of that extreme drought up in the far northwest. Uh, but we do have a lot more of that white color, especially across east central, south central, and up in far northwest Oklahoma. I mean, it's not a complete change, but at least it's a start. So each successive rainfall event, we have made a little bit of progress. And according to the USDA's topsoil moisture percent short to very short for November 7th, uh, we do have just 47% of the state percent short to very short. Uh, that's better than where we were a couple of months ago, even a month ago, where we're up in the 70% range. So again, each rainfall has brought that soil moisture scarcity down a bit. Now Wes showed you that quite a bit of the state's still waiting for its first freeze. And uh, you know, a lot of the country's still waiting for its first snowfall event. Let's take a look at the snowfall amounts from the previous three years at this point in time and see what we had. Okay, for 2021, much of the country still without its first snowfall event. Not extremely unusual, but a little bit unusual, uh, especially when we look at the previous two years. So last year at this time, of course, we had that big ice storm in Oklahoma and quite a bit of snow up in the northwestern part of the state. And much of the western two-thirds of the United States had at least one snowfall event uh, at this period in time. Sort of the same picture two years ago in 2019, uh, the week ending uh, November 15th, we do see that big snowfall event up in northwest Oklahoma that happened in the final week of October when Arnett received up to 13 inches of snow. But then we had a lot of the northern tier of the United States had its first snowfall event. Part of the west and the south central parts of the United States still waiting for their first event at that period. We're approaching winter, so all that stuff, freezes, snow, ice, it's all coming eventually, it's just a matter of time. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're joined now by Dr. Misha Manucheri, our OSU Extension weed scientist, to talk a little bit about managing fall weeds and, and looking ahead to spring. So in terms of where the fields are now, what kind of guidance do you have for our producers? So grassy weeds are always our number one. They're the most competitive with our wheat. So we should be looking at what's germinated, how much do we think is up, whether or not we want to invest in a fall application or maybe hold off till spring. Um, that's just going to depend on how intense our weed management plans are. So for those who do think that they want to do something this fall, yes. how should they move forward? So we have some species where we know they respond best for a fall application. Uh, rescue grass, which is one of our bromes, it primarily germinates in the fall. Spring applications don't work well. So if you have an early emerger, we should make a post-emergence application prior to next spring. Um, and we're a little chilly right now, but we have some warm temperatures coming. And we should always be thinking about, we want our crop actively growing, and we want our weeds actively growing. That will result in better kill and also better crop protection. So say folks are gonna hold off, but they may wanna start kind of planning ahead and, and looking toward early spring. Yeah. What's kind of the, the time frame and, and the management practice there? Yeah, good question. So 
If you're thinking of early spring, we do have many producers who like to hold off until um, nitrogen application and do some tank mixing. We can do that. The first step in any weed ID plan is we want to know what we have. So you have some time. If you don't know what you have, get in touch with your county educator. Um, let's find out what your weeds are so we invest in the right products. Before we go, we want to be sure to mention some of the research that you and your grad student have, have paired up on. Some of the results are about to be wrapped up. Yeah, yeah, we have um, an integrated weed management study on rescue grass, which um, I really think is one of the most difficult grasses to control. And we're always trying to find other practices besides herbicides that we can integrate um, in our weed management plans. Herbicides are great, but when we use them too much, we select for resistance. Um, so we're, we're definitely learning. We've raised a lot of questions. One thing that we have learned is delaying planting for those who might be kind of sneaking in some late plantings, um, even now in our southern counties. Um, we do see a reduction in weed populations when we delay. However, we're also seeing a sacrifice in, in grain yield. So we're always trying to balance. We want to have adequate yields and we want to control our weeds. We're still, we're still trying to figure that out, um, but that's some of the preliminary results. Okay, great. Well, we look forward to, to hearing more as that research continues. Thank you. Okay, Misha, thanks a lot. And a reminder, you can always find your county office on the Extension website. We have a link for you at sunup.okstate.edu. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. We are joined this week by Dr. Paul Beck, and we're going to talk about stocking rates on wheat pasture. Paul, we're encouraged now. We've actually had some moisture in the past few weeks, and it looks like wheat pasture's coming on. Yeah, we've uh, really had some growth in our wheat pasture th this last few weeks, and we went from really not knowing if we're going to have any fall pasture at all to having the prospects of having some, some wheat pasture. It may be delayed a few weeks beyond what our normal target turnout date would be, but we've got some prospects for you know, some fall grazing this year. It may be a little bit uh, less forage and a little bit later turnout, but we, we do have the potential for some good pasture. Relative to that, Paul, what, what kind of stocking rates do we normally look at? And what are we potentially looking at this year in light of our delayed moisture? So our uh, normal rule of thumb stocking rate for, for fall winter grazing on wheat pasture is about two acres per steer. So we're basing that on a 500 pound steer. Um, when we look at wheat pasture like this, it's, it's about four inches tall and, you know, using a rule of thumb about 200 uh, pounds of dry, forage dry matter per square inch in height, um, we're saying it's going to be about seven to 800 pounds of forage per acre in this case. So when we look at you know, targets of forage allowance that we're, we would use to set a stocking rate. You know, what we found is if we get five pounds of forage dry matter when we turn a calf out per pound of body weight, we can maximize gains and have a good potential for really good performance for the rest of the winter. So that's about 2,500 pounds for a 500 pound steer. With uh, 800 pounds of forage, if we we're gonna turn out today, we'd be looking at about three pound, or three acres per steer to hit that target. So at the time we're taping this right now, it looks like our forecast, we've got some 70, 75 degree days coming up in our seven to 10 day forecast. We're, we can expect to see a little more growth as we go into turnout. Yes, so uh, some research done here at Oklahoma State uh, several years ago um, found that they were able to produce about three to three and a half pounds of forage dry matter per acre for each growing degree day. Now a growing degree day is the average temperature minus 40 degrees. So if we have 70 degree day as a high and a you know 50 degree evening, that's an average temperature of about 60. So we have 20 growing degree days you know, for that day. So each day we could kind of expect 60 
to 70 pounds of forage accumulation during that period. So in, in 10 days, we could potentially get uh, you know, 600 pounds of, of forage accumulation per acre, and that would really help our stocking rates. Yes, yeah, for sure. What uh, other tips do we need to think about as we look at turnout this year? Um, if we're going to try to stock at, um, you know, two acres per steer at a time when we've got, you know, seven or 800 pounds per acre, we can still get the potential for good performance on those cattle. Um, what we want is a consistent three to four pounds of forage dry matter per pound of body weight. And um, so if, if we continue to grow and accumulate forage ahead of those calves, then we should be able to, to keep good performance on those calves. If we uh, get into some cold temperatures and it quits growing, we really need to monitor our forage condition and start supplementation or doing something to offset whenever they want, aren't able to consume enough forage to promote gains that we're looking at. Sure. Well, what kind of supplementation? Um, so protein, uh, protein levels in wheat are very high. So we really don't need to add a lot of protein uh, in a supplement. So, you know, a byproduct feed like soybean holes or wheat mids uh, would, would be a good choice. Uh, corn blended with any of these byproduct feeds would be a good choice. And we're looking at, you know, two to three pounds per day would do a lot of good in, in offsetting, a, a, you know, reduced forage availability. Well, Paul, thanks for joining us. We appreciate you joining us on Cow-Calf Corner. Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, the latest WASD is out. Any surprises? I don't think there was any surprises at all. You look at the pre-release estimates, they almost nailed everything on, on this WASD. The soybeans was off just a little bit. Uh, the reaction on the prices was nearly zilch, just minor moves each day during the week. So not many surprises. I do think it's important that we note that the USDA raised Russia's production from about 2.67 billion bushels up to about 2.7, 2.8 billion. The market, I think, expected that. I think all of us knew that it was going to be higher, but the USDA adjusted to higher production in that area. With that in mind, what are the current crop prices? Well, they haven't changed much as you'd expect. The wheat's around $7.70. These are uh, Manford, Oklahoma prices. Corn, $5.50. Sorghum, $5.60. Soybeans, $11.60. Uh, canola, there's no posted price for canola now. And cotton down south, uh, Western Oklahoma is $1.13 to $1.16 a pound for cotton. What about what the marketing is offering for 2022 harvested crops? Well, those are real good too. You look at uh, wheat, $7.70, essentially the same price we got right now. Corn a little lower at $5.20. Sorghum, $5.10. You notice the current price, sorghum slightly higher than corn, but you go out to next year, they're expecting those sor sorghum prices to get below corn. Soybeans, $11.50, the same as the soybean price. Canola, $13 a bushel for next year. I mean, what a canola price. And cotton, around 91 cents. So expected lower cotton prices, the other price is about the same. Any other market news that you're kind of keeping an eye on? Well, of course, we've got the harvest going on in Australia and Argentina. Those harvests are going uh, big guns right now. The crops are coming in as expected. There was some concern in Australia. They had some uh, rainy, wet weather in some of the areas. They thought they had reduced the uh, quality and, and the yields. Hasn't had any impacts yet. Uh, you've got uh, Russia. They're uh, talking about changing their export tax to adjust for the higher prices. We don't know what that's going to do to the market. Of course, China is always the wild card. A lot going on in the undercurrent. I personally am concerned about these higher prices and wonder how much of these higher prices is simply risk in the market, is our transportation problems. And if we get that solved, will prices fall? Uh, that's my concern. A lot happening, of course. Thanks for getting us up to speed. And we'll see you next week, Kim. November is typically one of the months that we always recommend that people deworm their horses in Oklahoma. 
So at the bare minimum, uh, we always recommend that you do deworm them twice a year. So we kind of use March and November. And then the rest of the time, we're really recommending that people think about doing strategic deworming and actually checking a fecal egg count exam to make sure their horse actually needs to be dewormed again. The reason that we're suggesting that is to try to cut back on essentially resistance uh, to our dewormers because we really don't have any other products to use and so we need to think about being a little bit more strategic in our management decisions so that we don't lose the efficacy of those products. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so we've moved away from the idea that horses should have zero worms. Um, and we now realize, you know what, it's probably okay. Uh, horses have evolved with worms for a long time. And so some worm burden is, is probably okay. Um, but we don't wanna see really high worm burdens because that actually can impact the health of the horse. Um, essentially, the, the worms are gonna be taking a lot of the nutrients from the horse. Certainly if there's a big population, it can even cause some blockages of the intestine, scarring, um, and some of the worms, when they migrate through the horse's body, can cause some tissue damage. So the, the, most of the worms that we talk about um, in the horse, and they're gonna lay eggs essentially in the horse's intestinal tract, and they're gonna pass out into the manure. So the horse is actually gonna get those worms by their eating in the grass, right? And so they're actually gonna ingest the larva um, that are at the stage that they're capable of infecting the horse. So a lot of it is manure contamination. So if you want more information on internal parasites and their control in horses, you can visit the SunUp website. Finally today, a look back at a unique OSU Ag Research Project, partnering our scientists with their peers in the Southern Great Plains as they try to solve the problem of woody plant encroachment. Once again, here's SunUp's Curtis Hare. So the Prairie Project is a USDA funded grant um, and there's four collaborators across four different states. So we have um, Oklahoma State here, we have Texas A&M, uh, University of Nebraska, and then we also have some collaborators in Kansas. The project is a five-year study into finding the best practices in controlling woody plant encroachment, whether it's wildlife habitat, water disruption, and land for grazing, the loss of grasslands negatively impacts the ecosystems of the Southern Great Plains. We know that in the Southern Great Plains, we're kind of losing the battle against woody plants coming into our grasslands. And so we're trying to look at different approaches to do that um, sustainably and economically. Well, woody brush encroachment is, is a serious problem because we are losing an ecosystem. Literally, grasslands are disappearing from, uh, from Oklahoma, from Texas, from the southern Great Plains and the entire Great Plains at alarming rates. It happens so quickly. You'll hear producers say, I lost my pasture overnight. Texas A&M Extension Rain Specialist and Prairie Project collaborator Morgan Treadwell says producers in Oklahoma and Texas face similar issues because many plant communities overlap. The overlap in plant communities is also what makes this partnership and collaboration so powerful um, because our ranchers and our producers are dealing with the same problems. And so when we can combine um, extension, outreach, education, and also the scientists from a research perspective, um, we, we stand a better chance. Project collaborators, who are all in extension, are studying a two-pronged controlling method patch burning followed by grazing cattle and goats together in the pasture. Adding goats to herds, uh, to existing cattle herds and trying to see how we can use them to further the control that we get from fire. Um, grasses don't try to defend themselves from grazing, they just grow back really quickly. But broadleaf plants and woody plants defend themselves with um, different chemicals that they produce. And goats are uniquely um, adapted to being able to process those different chemicals that those plants create. Goats, in my opinion, are an underlized resource. They're kind of a little uh, blessing in disguise and a diamond in the rough. They're very low maintenance. They add diversity to that grazing picture. So they're going to consume plant species that would not normally be consumed. We know that cattle are drawn to areas that have been recently burned because of the really nutritious growth that comes back after fire. But we don't actually know how goats are gonna to respond to that. And so we've put GPS collars on our goats on our cattle 
in addition to the GPS research, we're, actually, we're also actually tracking what's happening with the woody plants that grow in these pastures. The Prairie Project team isn't just testing the study on land owned by the universities. Local producers have volunteered their land and animals to the research. We are working with ranchers and producers who are starting from ground zero. So they're experiencing all these growing pains of putting in uh, goat friendly fencing. That initial cost can be, you know, uh, can be a lot, uh, especially when we start thinking about all the other challenges that ranchers and producers are already faced with. The initial cost of introducing goats to an existing cattle operation is a hurdle. But with the growing goat industry, stopping woody plant encroachment might not be the only benefit. It could also positively affect a producer's bottom line. You know, a lot of producers spend a fair amount of money uh, on spray, chemical control. Um, they may use fire or they may not. Uh, but goats, uh, you know, with their preferences for forage uh, are a natural way to control uh, woody species in particular and, and some uh, weed species. We anticipate it very likely will be a net benefit. So you may get the benefit of weed and brush control with the goats and at the same time add additional income to the overall operation with the uh, addition of a goat enterprise to the cattle operation. When you can introduce a win-win situation and scenario to a rancher and also increase their bottom line, their overall profit, um, that, that is what extens Extension is all about. That's what our mission is. And we need to make sure that this research ends up in the hands of the folks that can use it and also um, and benefit from it and feed their families from it. While there's only a few more years left in the grant, the Prairie Project team plans to continue this research well into the future. From the Rains Research Station in Payne County, I'm Curtis Hare. That'll do it for us this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also find us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.